Hello, welcome to week 11, lecture one, motion of planets and satellites. This uh, chapter 14-7, so we're gonna cover Kepler's laws, energy and orbits, and then we're gonna do an example. So jumping right in, Kepler's first law says, it, or it's called the law of orbits, and it says all planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. Um, so this is specific to our solar system, right? Like in that language, uh, but this is true for any object orbiting another object. Um, if we're instead talking about the moon orbiting the earth, the earth would be at one focus. Um, let's look at some of these things. So here is a focus in an ellipse. Um, so this focus is empty and this focus is where the sun is. And this is an elliptical orbit where this mass is orbiting the sun. Um, the maximum distance um, is given by RA. That would be the maximum distance from the sun to the planet is RA. And that's a, P a, a Pelion. A Pelion, I used to know how to say it. Um, or for the Earth Moon system, Apogee. And then the minimum distance is right here, like the closest approach, farthest approach. Um, that's called perihelion or perigee for the Earth Moon system. So, Kepler's second law is also known as the law of areas. Um, it says that a line joining any planet to the sun sweeps out equal area in equal time. So this show this image shows this concept um, for motion close to the sun. Well, first these are representing the um, distance traveled within the same time interval for this object in um, different parts of its orbit. So you can see that when it's close to the sun, it travels a lot farther in the same amount of time than when it's really far from the sun. Um, one second. And this uh, relationship is saying that the area of this shaded re region is the same as this shaded region if those time intervals are the same. And really what it's saying is that a planet moves faster when it's closer to the sun and slower when it's farther away. Um, and this comes from conservation of angular momentum. So let's take a look at that. Um, so the area of this sliver here is delta A, uh, which is one half the, it, and we're thinking of it as this triangle. It's not perfect representation, but it's pretty close. Um, and it's one half the base times the height of the triangle or one half R delta theta times R. But then this is talking about the, um, change in area with time. So we can look at the time derivative of the area. Um, and if we here treat it as a limit, we can say that this is the delta A um, that we just talked about here. So we end up with one half R delta theta times R um, over the time interval. Um, and then um, we can rearrange things a little bit and get that the change in angle over change in time over top of each other. And we end up with one half R squared times omega or the angular velocity. And we know that the angular momentum is the rotational inertia times the angular velocity. Um, and for a particle, which we can treat um, the planet as a particle on this scale, um, we get mr squared times the angular velocity. Excuse me. Um, and if we take the end result of these two equations, um, we see that the time derivative of the area is the angular um, momentum divided by two times the mass of the particle or the planet. And if there are no external torques 
acting, then the angular momentum is conserved. So that means that throughout the whole orbit, the change in area over time is constant. So like I said, Kepler's second law is um, conservation of angular momentum. Also, I'm pretty sure this is meant to be zero. I only just noticed it right now. So don't worry about that limit, but you get the idea. So now Kepler's third law is the law of periods. And this says the square of the period of any planet about the sun is proportional to the cube of the planet's mean distance from the sun. Um, so let's see what that means. Starting with the gravitational force and the force for an object in circular motion. Um, so gravitational force, uh, GMM over R squared, and then the net force for an object in circular motion is the mass times the centripetal acceleration, which is also given by the mass times the velocity squared divided by the radius or distance from the center of the circle. So we can set these two equal to each other. Um, and this is what we end up with here. But we can also, there's a relationship between velocity and period. Um, and that comes from 2 pi r divided by the period equals velocity. So we can plug that into this relationship and do some rearranging that I'm not showing you. Um, and we end up with the period squared is equal to 4 pi squared divided by gm times r cubed, or the radius, excuse me, cubed. Um, and if we want to go even further, we can simplify this and just say, that the period squared is proportional, that's the symbol, to the radius cubed. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out though also is that for an elliptical orbit, um, the radius of the orbit that we would use in that relationship is the semi-major axis, which is this given by A here. And it is from the center of the ellipse um, to the kind of far flat edge, or like the, the major axis being the longest axis. There's also the concept of semi-minor axis, which is from the center to like the top or bottom. Um, and that's listed as B, but you don't have to worry about that. Um, anyway, so if the orbit is elliptical, this relationship is still true, but instead of like RA or RP, you use A. Um, yeah, and now we can look at Kepler's third law or how it plays out um, in our solar system. Um, and you can see the connection here in these relationships. Um, you can test it if you want to. Um, but the thing I actually wanted to point out is this column here, which is T squared over a cubed or the period squared divided by the semi-major axis cubed or the radius. Um, and this should be the same for all of the objects in our solar system because the this is equal to four pi squared over GM um, from, let me just go back briefly, um, this right here. So what happened is that column is just dividing by the radius cubed or the semi-major axis cubed and putting it on this side. So this is what's on the other side, but in our solar system, this is constant because four pi squared over G, that's, those are all constants. And then this M represents the mass that is the focus of the orbit. So the mass of the sun in our solar system. So that is constant um, for all of them. So this column should be pretty much the same. And it is, it's all around three times 10 to the negative 34 years squared per meter cubed, very odd units, but in the column, that's what we're getting. So now uh, I finally want to briefly connect this back to energy. So from the force equations we had um, in the derivation of Kepler's third law, we had you know, this relationship. Um, and we can simplify this by uh, getting velocity squared on its own. 
and we end up with velocity squared equals gm over r. Um, and kinetic energy is one half and the squared. So we can plug in this to kinetic energy. Um, and we get that the kinetic energy of a um, orbital motion is gmm over 2r. But to remind you of something else from last week, the potential energy of um, the sort of motion is given by negative gmm over r. So that tells us that the kinetic energy of an orbit is negative one half the potential energy of the orbit. And then this also plays out um, in the total energy, assuming there aren't any external forces, being one half the potential energy. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to connect it back to energy, um, bring it full circle, orbital motion joke. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's move on to the example problem now. Um, I'll read it to you real quick. The asteroid belt circles the sun between or the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. One asteroid has a period of five Earth years. What are the asteroid's orbital radius and speed? So we will find that. Okay. And so we're going to start out with um, taking the period from years to seconds. So five years times 365 days uh, for one year times 24 hours in one day um, times uh, 3,600 seconds in one hour. And this, um, oh yeah, of course I didn't calculate it by itself. Let's just calculate that by itself real quick so I can write it out for you. So that's five times 365 times 24 times 3,600. And that is um, 1.58 times 10 to the 6, 7, 8, times 10 to the 8 seconds. So that's what the period is. And then um, the equations we just covered, t squared equals 4 pi squared over gm times the radius cubed. Um, and then it also asks for velocity, which is uh, b squared is gm over r. Um, we don't have r yet. We need to find it. So let's rearrange this equation to get that. Um, so r equals, so that's just going to be um, dividing this um, whole term on both sides and then cube rooting everything. So gm over four pi squared times t squared and then everything to the one third or third root. So now we'll plug stuff in. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared times the mass of the sun, 1.98 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. And then uh, the period we just calculated, 1.58 times 10 to the 8 seconds squared. Um, and then this is divided by 4 pi squared. And everything to the 1 third. So we end up with a radius of 4.37 times 10 to the 11 meters. And then we can use that to find the velocity. So I'll just take the square root of both sides to get just velocity and not velocity squared. Gm over r. And then we can just plug in things again. So we get 0.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared times 1.98 times 10 to the 30 kilograms divided by mm -mm -mm, r. 
um, which is 4.37 times 10 to the 11 meters. And now I have to plug that into my calculator because I forgot to solve that part of the problem ahead of time. Square root of 6.7 e to the negative 11 times, sorry, I need um, 1.9 e, e to the 30 divided by 4.37 e to the 11. Okay, so I get a velocity of um, seventeen point four kilometers per second. So let's go back over this briefly. Um, so the period we were given was five years, and I wanted to get that in seconds. Um. And then we have this relationship for between period and radius, and this asks for both the radius and speed. Um, and then we have this relationship for orbital speed also. So if we rearrange the equation above to get the radius, and we found 4.37 times 10 to the 11 meters. And then if we just take the square root of both sides of this equation, we get this, um, and that will give us the velocity and we get a velocity of 17.4 kilometers per second. Okay, that is everything for this lecture.